The United Kingdom's Conservative Party announced Monday that Liz Truss was selected as its new leader. It's an honor to be elected as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. And I think one of the most depressing sights when you're driving through England is seeing fields that should be full of crops or livestock full of solar panels. What? 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 You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. You're kidding me, right? Are you kidding me? 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 Yeah, no, no, no. No, no, no. Hell no. Hello and welcome to episode 130 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And that must be, I'm James Whittingham. And this week, British Conservatives have indeed elected their new PM, and she doesn't like the sight of solar panels. Oh, Boris, who'd have thunk I'd ever miss your puffy ass and, you know, that thing on your head. In a shocking announcement, General Motors offers to buy out any Buick dealers that don't want to sell electric vehicles. It's shocking because I had no idea Buick still existed. I learned a new word that describes everyone you hate on Twitter. And it's not donkey nobbler. And it's not donkey nobbler. California suffers an unprecedented heat wave and the worst drought in 1,200 years. Worst of all, it's become unfashionable to say, but it's a dry heat. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. Also on this edition of I Hope You're Not Wearing White Because It's After Labor Day, Brian, the pipeline plane that flies over my house is flying lower than expected. Much, much lower. Californians are asked not to charge their electric cars. Russia has a clog in their oil pipes again. And a wildfire warning in Alberta reminds people you can't run a gas pump without electricity. Uh, first of all, how's your back this week? Yeah, definitely better. I am, uh, you know, walking without a cane for the first time. In, you literally walked <laughs> in with a cane? I was really walking with a cane. You were literally a hobbled old man for a while. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think I'm doing okay, although I will have to probably switch my seating position halfway through the show. All right. As we record this, uh, our whole province of Saskatchewan in Canada is in international news, and I thought it would be weird if we didn't talk about that. Um yeah, we've been having all kinds of emergency alerts on our phones night and day of uh, a terrible tragedy that has taken place on a First Nation and around. And for a while, the killer, the mass killer, has been uh, believed to be hiding in the city that we live in. And just before the show, these they think they've sighted him on the reserve again. So we really don't know what's going on. But uh, yeah, so if you listen to the show and you hear us talking about it, well, you've heard it in the news and... Uh, and here we are. We're both here. Brian's safe in his farm shelter. Yeah. yeah. Our thoughts go to all the, the victims. And uh, yeah, it's not too often we make international news. And sometimes it's for good reasons and uh, sometimes not so good. Yeah. Well, um, let's hope for, for a good outcome and, uh, and better things in the future. Yeah. So um, speaking of our hometown... Um, it, it came up on a podcast this week. Um, so remember when I retired, I said my retirement project was going to be making my own shoelaces? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I learned that from a TV show called Going Deep with David Reese, one of the greatest TV shows of all time. Absolutely loved it. It, you know, covered things like how to tie your shoes. Fantastic show. Right. Uh, anyway, David Reese and John Kimball have a podcast called Election Profit Makers, and it's a humorous podcast about political commentary, American politics. Uh, but they go off on a lot of tangents on the show, which is why I like it. And they started talking recently about the old American Top 40 show with Casey Kasem. And so I decided to write them a letter, and they read my letter on the show this week, which was a lot of fun for me. And it, it mentions our hometown, and we have a clip. Brian writes in, Dear Kid Midas and Long John Silver, as a teenager in the early 1980s, my first real job was as the overnight DJ on CKCK, a top 40 radio station in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. In addition to overnights, I would often operate the American Top 40 show on Saturday afternoons, and it would come in on four vinyl LPs every week, Incredible. 30 minutes per side. I can't believe they used to do the radio shows on records. Yes. 
Now, he says, I managed to keep a souvenir from my time at this station, and that's the complete vinyl set of the 1983 <laughs> Top 100 Countdown from American Top 40. Oh. And he attached pictures along with a picture of the skyline for Regina, Saskatchewan. It's, it's pretty sweet. I'm telling you, Canada, pretty much every city in Canada has a great skyline. <laughs> that's uh, That one guy sounds like me, and going off on <laughs> tangents sounds like us. So yeah, it's there's a very similar dynamic on the show there, I would say, um, and perhaps I'm the straight man, um, you're the funny man. But in any case, yeah, they like to talk about skylines. That's one of the tangents, the aesthetic qualities of city skylines, and so he they appreciated the skyline of our city, and yeah, in their opinion, most Canadian cities have a fantastic looking skyline, and uh, I don't know, I would have to kind of agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> They're not bad. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I remember somebody from uh, going through town once. I told the story in the show before. I was going to a, a newspaper conference, a student newspaper conference in Winnipeg, and he, yeah. uh, he went through Regina. He said, hey, your town looks brand new because uh, he just <laughs> drove by to look at the skyline, and it's all glassy yeah. towers, or at least it was 30 years ago when I was in university. And yeah. uh, apparently wherever they were from didn't have that. So, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, and the other nice thing about our skyline, it rises out of a completely flat prairie. Like, it's very unusual to have a city built on a completely flat thing. But then the other part of the call, so yeah, it, it just, it makes me sound super old to be relating this story, but I used to operate the American Top 40 show. It came in on records. They would make a record every week, four LPs, and that's how we would play the show on the radio. That is amazing. come in the mail, I guess. I don't remember. But so I have the complete top 100 countdown from 1983. It was usually meant to be played like on New Year's Eve. You start at 4 p.m. The show wraps up at midnight. Top 100 hits of the year. So next year, it'll be the 40th anniversary of this 1983, you know, top 100. So I've always been meaning to have like a New Year's Eve party or something where we, you know, play the, uh, you know, the 1983 Top 100 Countdown. But I don't know, then I'd have to stay up till midnight, which I don't think I'd Oh, do. that's tough for you. That's tough for you. That would be, uh, you would need an ejection of some sort. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Probably, possibly illegal. Uh, yeah, so huge thanks to uh, David and John and the Election Profit Makers. So just to be clear, clear, that was just the year-end show that came in on vinyl, not the weekly Top Oh, 40. no, no, every week. Every, every week it week. came, the Top 40 yeah. came in on vinyl. On vinyl, yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And you can go on, you know, eBay and Discogs and you can find them, you know, for sale. You can buy them sometimes. I mean, it's, I think the one I've got is probably worth a few, couple hundred bucks or something. But Was it like the, the Casey Case I'm talking was on vinyl too? Oh yeah, everything. So, um, so I you would didn't have, have to, to do insert, anything. I would have to insert the commercial break. So oh. he would say, and coming up next, right after this. And then you'd have to pause the turntable, play the commercials, and then start the turntable back up again. Have you ever paused a turntable while it was playing something and went? <laughs> Don't remember doing that. No, good, but good. We used to play songs on carts, like they were sort of like eight tracks. That's yeah. how all the songs were played on the station. Yeah. So sometimes, like, there's a few songs that have pauses in them, like the music stops for a second. So sometimes, for fun, we would pause it. The the pause for a little extra. <laughs> you, you know. dirty bastards on late night radio, <laughs> screwing yeah, with people. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you rebel. Um, that's funny. Funny yeah. and weird. So that's our broadcasting heritage here at uh, the Clean Energy Show. Well, that is so weird. Like, I, I didn't, you've never mentioned that to me before. That's a, such a weird thing. I wonder if yeah. it was just practical because they could stamp them out at the time. They couldn't, like nowadays they could stamp a CD, I suppose. Uh, yeah, there I'm, were enough stations to play the show that, yes, yeah, there must have been you know, thousands of them. copies. Like, there must have been a lot that they would have had to make. Yeah, like a thousand or two thousand, maybe. Who knows? And a, a cart machine would have been more involved. Um, yeah, or reel to reels would have been the other option. And right. It was probably, yeah, I guess easier to make records than reel to reels. Interesting. And this was 1983. Okay. Well, I was driving into my um, North Regina. Um, subdivision, I guess, made in the late 70s. So it's still at the edge of the city. And I saw a plane flying over the um, subdivision here from a different perspective. It was the pipeline plane from a different perspective, wasn't flying overhead. Yeah. I thought the damn thing was landing. Like it, it was mm -hmm. so low. 
So mm -hmm. I was kind of curious, and I, 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 I used a Flight Tracker 24 software online um, and in my app to track it sometimes to see where it's going. And it's, it says calibrated 2,100 feet, but I thought that was 2,100 feet because that's where the air ambulance helicopters fly. Uh, it's not, though. It's not above terrain. It's above sea level, and we're 1,900 feet above sea level. So that sucker is 200 feet above the ground. Yeah. And this is the plane that I've got that a toy checks. drone, Brian, that almost goes that high. And if I hacked it, it would. <laughs> I'm 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 more of like it's a very serious subject. Um, it is a toy drone. It is under the weight limit for doing that. Yeah. And I don't fly it anymore because the batteries are dead. I can't find them. They expanded. They are cheap batteries. They expanded. Now they won't even fit in. Uh, we'll talk more about that stuff later. But it's not out of the question that somebody, anybody could be flying a drone at a couple hundred feet and run into this airplane, which, which by the way, inspects the pipelines for leaks. Yeah. So I did some research on pipeline inspection planes. They call them pipeline patrol pilots. And apparently in the old days, uh, not that long ago, they would fly 50 to 100 feet off the ground. Now, I'm sure they wouldn't do that over a city because there would be yeah. cell towers and, and things like that. And by yeah. the way, a cell tower is probably that high in some cases, so yeah. that's interesting. But somebody died in Edmonton in 2013 doing it because they were taking pictures. Their, their job is to take photographs and yeah. fly the damn plane by themselves. Wow. Well, I remember I, I made a film one time where we rented a helicopter and we filmed some stuff from a helicopter. And my recollection back then was a uh, thousand feet was as low as the helicopter was allowed to go over the city when we were flying over the city to take some shots. So the pipeline planes must have their own special kind of uh, regulations. It gives us PTSD here. It sounds like World War II because they, they think they sound like they're flying right over your head. You know, incoming, yeah. always yell incoming when it comes to my family, just as a joke. Nobody gets it, but I amuse myself and that's, you know, how it goes. That's all that matters. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th some of them, I guess this, this plane just does the pipeline through the small city we live in of 200,000 people or so just does that stretch. So it's, it lands, it takes off and lands in about, you know, less than 15 minutes and it's done its hmm. whole work. Wow. Uh, the other day, though, I tracked it and it took off and did it twice. And then it took off down the pipeline, which also splits our bedroom community of Emerald Park slash White City. Yeah. Diagonally, the, the pipeline you, just splits it in half. You're on the wrong side of the pipeline. I know. <laughs> but well, it's it's still fun, and you know, there's lots of gophers out there. And I I heard on the radio that they're going to stop poisoning the little bastards. Uh, they can be annoying. Uh, yeah. The Richardson ground squirrel, which we have here in abundance, and they will reproduce. They will come into my yard and eat my strawberries, yep. uh, mm -hmm. and assert themselves, <laughs> and get cocky. I've spent lots of time staring at them, and they will. Uh, they chirp. They make this high pitched chirp, and it's just really irritating after yeah. hours it's you know kind of bad it's like having a really nasty uh, crow around or something by the way the crows disappeared i mentioned that we started the summer lots of crows they're gone i don't know who shot them or ate them or whatever but so they're gone yeah i guess they're moving on so yeah that's that's interesting that this pipeline and they've got you know extra gas tanks as you can see there that's what the plane looks like and that was my flight path tracking it at just 2075 feet and that's not very high. Above sea level, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know what? CBC had a news story that uh, perked my ears up on California. Uh, I guess the governor down there asked them to not charge your EVs. And I thought, okay, well, that's kind of a feeding into the Facebook paranoia of the right where they uh, yep. feed memes like that. Try not to use uh, too much electricity in those key hours, and the key hours are between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. Even electric cars, supposedly a long-term solution to fossil fuel usage, are part of this problem. Owners of Teslas and other e-cars are being asked not to charge their vehicles during that five-hour period, prompting some to ask questions about an eventual complete conversion to electric cars. Severin Bornstein is with the University of California. Well, there's no way we could keep up right now if we suddenly uh, went to 100% clean cars. Um, so what do you think of that? Any impressions? 
Yeah, well, it's annoying because, of course, we can't immediately switch to 100% uh, electric cars. It, it's a gradual thing, but um, there's certainly a number of factors being stacked on top of one another that is turning this into a much more difficult year for energy grids than I think we ever expected. So with California, it's this massive heat wave. They're well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in California. And um, the worst drought in 1,200 years. Did you see that? No, 1,200? Yeah, that's what they're saying. This is the worst drought in 1,200 years in the Western United States. Well, and it's, it's been a weird pattern. And uh, I heard somebody say that uh, it was El Nino. The uh, ocean current was sticking around for a second and possibly third winter. Wow. And that has uh, done weird things. And one of the things is has bunched up the systems in North America. So we get this big ridge going way up to Alaska and that gets hot and we get hot here in uh, central Western Canada. And, you know, yesterday was the hottest day on record for Regina. And as you know, I heat my above ground. For this date, yeah above ground uh, swimming pool, oh, it was the second hottest day of the summer. The hottest day of the summer was also in September where it got to wow. 36 degrees. It's crazy. Wow. I mean, that's never happened before, ever, ever, ever. I've lived here almost all my life and that, you know, I, I was a weather geek when I was a kid. I paid attention to these things and uh, yeah, it's weird. So I heat my pool with solar panels uh, like thermal solar panels and it's the first time I've ever been in the pool in September with those, without a gas heater in my yeah. pool. And it's weird because it doesn't work as well as it does in June. You know, it, it, the, the sun goes down early and it goes behind trees, <laughs> my neighbor's trees. Mm -hmm. So uh, the pool itself gets shaded and it's unpleasant to be in there when you're not in the sun. So it takes a longer time to heat up. Anyway, it's just weird. Yeah, and of course, the other thing that's happening with a massive drought, and this is not just California, but places in Europe this is happening too, is the hydroelectric cannot run at full capacity because they just don't have the water behind the dams that they normally do. So the Hoover Dam, uh, Lake Mead, there was another mob body found the other day in Lake Mead. So Lake Mead is the reservoir for the Hoover Dam, produces lots of hydroelectric power but it's down to like something like 30% of its maximum level now. And so they can't generate as much electricity as normal. And yeah, they're finding bodies now. The, the water is so low. They're finding bodies in there that have been there for decades. And the rivers are low in Germany. So you can't yeah. transport coal. Yeah. And the water is too hot to cool some of the nuclear plants in, I believe, France. Uh, and this, this is now, this isn't a hundred years from now, this isn't 50 years from now, all this yeah. weird stuff is happening now and posing problems for non, you know, well, non-solar and wind, I would say. Yeah. And the other thing I would mention here is, I think we talked about it, but there's a Tesla virtual power plant pilot project going on in California. So they've run it three times now, and they're probably running it again today. So today is expected to be perhaps the biggest peak of this energy crisis in California. They may have to go to blackouts today in California as we record this, because they may not uh, be able to produce enough energy. But anyway, just it, it's... It's not enough to save the grid, but these virtual power plant in California can output up to 50 megawatts, um, which is, you know, a, a promising start. Imagine eventually when, you know, every home has a backup battery, um, that would be enough to kind of stabilize these problems with the grid. But I thought that was super encouraging. 50 megawatts from a virtual power plant. These are Tesla power walls in people's homes that are connected with software. And when called upon, they can all shoot power uh, to the grid at up to 50 megawatts, apparently. And 50 megawatts is five times the peak capacity of the solar plant that I visited in Saskatchewan. Um, yeah. One of the first ones that came on. The only, the only ones that they're allowing now is 10 megawatts. So 10 megawatts, yeah. This is five times what that is. And that just, you know, further illustrates how puny that, that solar farm from Sask Power is. Um, yeah, so they're expecting rolling blackouts. It's expected to be 115 degrees today in Sacramento. That's 46 Celsius. That's a, that would be a record. And yep. people are going to turn on the air conditioners. They're telling people not to charge their electric cars. Um, 
especially during peak hours. And, you know, I don't think people do because in, in California, there's like peak energy demand, right? Yeah. Um, I was posting this on Twitter. Like it, it's, if you have an EV, you can get a special plan on uh, the uh, the grid there, the, the utility, and they will, you know, they'll charge you less overnight. So if you have yeah. an EV plan, you pay, I don't know, it's... It's a third or something like that of what the demand is during the day in the early evening. And then you can charge all you want from like 11 on or something. Yeah, and that's a good example of how we are going to adapt. And we're not going to switch to 100% electric cars overnight. But that's one of the strategies going forward as we slowly uh, transition to electric And cars. I should say, I think it's like 25 cents overnight. Uh, so that's not, that's twice what we're, almost twice what we're paying. I guess ours are creeping up too, but... Uh, 25 cents per kilowatt, per kilowatt hour. hour. So it's not... That is, yeah, that's still kind of pricey. It's not the, like the three cents that some places are talking about charging EV yeah. owners to charge overnight. But that is one way. You, you, Your neighbors will say, well, you know, the grid can't handle it because they read it on a meme on Facebook. Well, that's BS. You know, if we charged overnight, we have the capacity to meet yeah. what the peak demand is and it falls off overnight and you can, re, you, you can just... There's lots of buffer there between what overnight use is and what the peak is that you could charge, you know, in some grids right now, you could just charge all the electric, if everybody had an electric car, you could charge them all and it'd be fine. Cause they're only charging yeah. for a couple of hours too, like at most, Yeah, usually. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, an example of how these grids just need to plan and manage and just the extreme weather that we're having this year is kind of revealing maybe who has done the best planning and who has not. I mean, the governor could have easily said, don't cook supper in your oven <laughs> yeah, yeah. or don't do he, a load of laundry. <laughs> but yeah. they went after electric cars and said, don't charge them. And nobody's, very few people are charging them anyway. Um, yeah. What they need to do is say, turn up your thermostat by a degree or two uh, and, you know, just take it easy because the peak, we don't want a rolling blackout. Do your thing if you can, if you want to. Uh, and an industry can can help with that as well. They can uh, slow down their shifts at factories or whatever. But yeah, so we'll see what happens uh, if there are, in fact, I guess they're 5,000 megawatts short of its power supply uh, peak demand that's forecasted by their computers. And then it'll hit at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, which is a couple of hours after we're recording this. Russia's at it yeah. again. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. So, yeah, Russia has again stopped supplying gas to Germany through the pipeline that we've been talking about um, over the past few weeks on the show. So, again, Russia has said, no, no more gas for you, Germany. Um, they were trying to build up gas reserves in Germany. And they have said, Germany has said finally that they are still planning to close those three nuclear power plants that are scheduled to close by the end of the year. They're going to go ahead with it, but the kind of compromise is they're going to keep two of them on standby, whatever that means. I mean, I guess if they completely mothballed everything, they couldn't start it up again, but they're going to not completely mothball everything and have two of the three on standby until April so that they possibly could be restarted um, if they need to. This is a remarkable thing that you talked about last week. If you missed last week's show, you might want to go listen to that because there's a lot of stipulations going on with those plants that they have to fix or not fix. Yeah. And it's a challenge. Yeah. No, I, I often think about, you know, Mad Max, the Mad Max movies, which I love. And it, it's all based around gasoline because it's the wasteland in Australia. And, you know, gasoline is the precious resource after society has collapsed. But, you know, if we were to have this Mad Max future now, it would really be solar panels and batteries would be the precious resource. And it's a much, much simpler thing than having to like make gasoline and store gasoline or process it or whatever you have to do. And the same thing with nuclear power plants, like a nuclear power plant's not going to be much use in a post-apocalyptic world because it's too complicated to run. And yeah, uh, yeah so I, I did enjoy that um, segment on last week's show. It's not as simple as just deciding to keep a plant open or close it. Nuclear power plants have so many rules and regulations and laws. They would literally have to change the laws in Germany uh, to keep those power plants open. And hats off to the employees of the nuclear power plants in the Ukraine, which are essentially prisoners 
of the Russians yeah. and who've decided, because speaking of, you know, you know, not being used in uh, an apocalypse, well, you have to have the expertise there and they're, they're basically forcing them to be there. It's just a horrible, horrible situation. Yeah. And Brian, speaking of, uh, you know, um, speaking of emergency alerts, we've got a whole bunch of alerts, but Alberta had some emergency alerts that I'm going to make fun of, uh, or at least make light of, because um, Jasper National Park in Alberta, straddling the Alberta-BC border, it is, you know, arguably one of our national park's best, you know, areas. It's amazing. It's Jasper's beautiful. It's so great. It's so beautiful and, and less touristy than Banff because it's a bit more out of the way. Uh, it is experiencing, unfortunately, a wildfire due to the heat wave that we've been talking about, and it was started by lightning. But here's what the um, the CBC News story said about it. It said, before Jasper lost power Sunday evening, the Alberta Emergency Alert System uh, advised residents to prepare for a possible power outage in the town of Jasper, including advising people to fill up their vehicle's fuel tank as gas stations rely on electricity. And people come to us and say, what do you do with the power comes out? They come out to those parking lots with their EVs and they say, what do you do if the power goes out? As if they run on <laughs> extension cords, you know? Yeah. Uh, the fact is you, you charge them and you have hundreds of kilometers of range and the power goes out yeah. and then you drive like you would. And if the gas station has no power, uh, the char if, if you had no power, you could drive to where there is power and charge it up if you needed to. Yeah, and Jasper's always had kind of an isolated electricity system because it's in kind of a remote place. And I think there's only kind of one power line going in and out. So they have frequent blackouts in Jasper. So perhaps the residents are used to this. But I remember being in Jasper a few years ago and the power was out. It was out for hours. But where did we go? We went to the one restaurant or there was a couple that had generators. Wow. Like, this happens frequently enough that this restaurant had a big enough generator to, to keep themselves running. Well, it's wilderness. They have, you know, it's mountain wilderness. You have power lines that are hard to get to. You have to helicopter people in there. And yeah, and it, if that's a perfect place for a battery backup system when they become available or. Yeah, I, and I think they are working on that. I and they're, they're running generators to do the, the uh, well. So I think the power is out right now. So if anybody in Jasper is listening to us, hello. Uh, but their power's out and they're running the uh, the streetlights and the well for the water and stuff like that off of uh, generators. And it'd be nice to maybe have an alternative to that. Yeah, so General Motors is going to offer buyouts to their Buick dealers. So this is very similar to a story we had um, last year where they were offering buyouts to Cadillac dealers. So these are sub-brands within General Motors. And uh, when they offered it to Cadillac dealers, about 320 out of the 880 retailers accepted the offer. And apparently the buyouts for the Cadillac dealers was in the range of 300,000 to a million dollars, um, a payout to you know get them to stop selling Buicks or stop selling Cadillacs. And uh, this is because General Motors realizes they have too many dealerships they cannot go forward with this many dealerships in an electric vehicle future. So this is a sign of the times and, uh, you know, good on General Motors for planning for the future like that. And uh, we'll see how it goes. So there's about 2,000 Buick dealers and they're all going to be offered this deal and, and some of them will, uh, will have to go away. Isn't it like uh, the angle that they you know, the big dealers didn't want to sell EVs, and if they want to get out of it, they can. Isn't that just like uh, how they're talking about this? Yeah, and of course, switching to an EV dealership is going to be perhaps an expensive proposition. There'd, there'd be money involved, and so I think this is a buyout really for the kind of the smaller dealerships that don't think that they can make enough money off of uh, EVs. As we've discussed many times, they don't need oil changes. They need much less maintenance um, so yeah, it's, um, it's for those dealerships that just think they, they don't want to make the effort or spend the money, uh, to go to EVs cause they don't think it's going to be worth it. Well, my elderly neighbors will be disappointed because they bought a Buick recently. Buick SUV. Oh, really? <laughs> and that's what I said to myself. Oh, I didn't know Buicks existed anymore. Yeah. Well, I don't know why they don't just shut out the brand cause the average age of the buyer has got to be in their seventies. Seventies. How about a hundred? Eighties? hundred. <laughs> I'm thinking old, old, old people who are living in the 50s. 
Uh, I would never, I don't want to buy a Cadillac or a Buick, but you know, the, the Cadillac Lyric is pretty, it's got, it checks all the, the check boxes, you know, like it, it ticks off a lot of things, fast charging yeah. range and, um, yeah, but maybe I'll end up with a used one of those one of these days. So yeah. go ahead. Uh, Germany. Uh, some more news from Germany. So over the summer, they introduced this really interesting deal for cheap rail in Germany. And they did this because of the high fuel prices in Germany. This is really part of the whole strategy, energy crisis in Europe. Um, you know, fuel is just too expensive. Um, and of course, you know, also the more people drive, the more it contributes to greenhouse gases. So over the three months of the summer, Germany offered for $9, which is about nine euros a month, a train ticket to go anywhere in Germany. And this has worked really well. It has saved about 1.8 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, yeah, people took advantage of this. And um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, of course, it's not necessarily as possible uh, where we live in the isolated uh, prairies. But when you have a proper rail system like they do in um, pretty much all the countries in Europe, uh, why not offer incentives and, and get people to use it? And uh, it, it benefits everyone. I wonder, I wonder if that'll spread through Europe, you know, uh, just because the, there's a big crunch coming on energy and yeah. maybe that idea will spread and that will also maybe change some people's habits. Yeah, I hope so. And of course, it's also just a bit of a help because, you know, gasoline is just so expensive. So it's a way to help out your population and give them a break on the high fuel prices. Brian, the UK finally has a new uh, prime minister to replace Mr. Boris Johnson. And Right. So Liz Truss, I, I haven't seen a picture. What's her hair like? Uh, it's more organized, I would say. Definitely more organized. <laughs> okay. That's a good sign. <laughs> Doesn't seem to have a life of its own. It seems fine. Uh, as every other, you know, person in England has normal hair, but not Boris. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So she's weird. She doesn't like the sight of solar panels. Yeah, that was quite the clip you played at the beginning. Well, let's just replay it again. And I think one of the most depressing sights when you're driving through England is seeing fields that should be full of crops or livestock full of solar panels. The hell's wrong with her? You know, she started as a, a social democrat and she was an anti-nuclear activist when she was young. But at some point at university, a switch went off and she became hard right. And she's vowed wow. to be a very conservative conservative because that's what she campaigned on. I always think it's fantastic when I see a field of solar panels, but also, yeah. you know, agrivoltaics, which you talk about frequently, you can have both. You can have crops and solar panels. You can have sheep grazing. You can have goats grazing. Uh, it's it's a win-win. Um, it's, uh, it's sad that she's insane. <laughs> it's sad that she's dumb about this, and as many people yeah. in her party are. But you know, uh, there's only 14% of Brits are against the net zero plans yeah. of Boris Johnson. 14%. That's yeah. You can't have as... I mean, fourteen percent of people are against sunny days. Like, there's just yeah, that's unheard of. Like, that's a very strong support for clean energy and net zero. Yeah, so that's a weird stand for her to take. It's not a good. It might, you know, she's making it a uh, um, sort of a climate, uh, sort of a culture war, uh, yeah. using the climate as a culture war thing. She doubled down on her comments during the leadership campaign that farmers' fields shouldn't be full of solar panels and. Several conservative MPs have raised it. And, you know, solar farms in the UK currently account for 0.08% of total land use. Wow. Uh, that's very little land use right now. Uh, under the government's net zero plan, solar farms, this is by, this is getting rid of climate change, right? Addressing climate change, Paris Accord targets and all that over the next 30 years would be 0.6 of all land use. 0.6%. So about half of 1% of land use would be solar in the UK. And that's not accounting for uh, efficiency improvements as we move forward. Uh, we'll need less panels and maybe there'll be different ways to deploy them. So it just doesn't make any sense to me. 
Yeah, it's a strange thing to, uh, you know, plant her flag on. Uh, anyway, okay, Brian, staying... I just want to add one thing. Uh, Solar Energy UK says that this amount of land use will be less than the amount of land currently used for golf courses. That is the 0.6% of uh, UK yeah. land in meeting, you know, saving the freaking planet is less than yeah. golf courses. No, and golf courses are kind of notoriously bad for the environment because they, they take up so much space for the enjoyment of so few people. And they take so many resources to, you know, water and uh, maintain those lawns that... Uh, Apologies to golfers. Yeah. Let's, let's take all the golf courses in the world and just put solar panels on them. That would be great. All right. So staying in Europe, again, European energy crisis. Uh, France is looking to cut their energy use by about 10% this year. So again, energy crunch. France is having problems with their nuclear plants. Um, you know, they... they um, aren't able to share as much energy back and forth with other countries like Germany, who's having their problems. So coming into the winter, uh, they have said that they want to cut energy use by about 10%. So in the winter, this is going to mean setting your thermostat in your house at about 19 Celsius or 66 Fahrenheit, which is a genuine sacrifice. I would not want to do that. I, we've been very spoiled <laughs> of just being able to kind of set the temperature. I, you know, I, 22 Celsius is kind of where I set it. So 19 would be freezing for me. Yeah, I'm, uh, where am I? I'm around 21, I think. Winter's been is so far behind us and yet so close yeah. in front of us. <laughs> You're a kid. Yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> But that's it's up, looming it's up. when I first moved to this house, I was a 20 degree man, Brian. Yeah. And uh, now that I'm Me old, I'm not making energy up. anymore in my body. I'm just getting old. <laughs> I'm supposed to eat less. That's why the, the, the seniors menu 55 plus is cheaper at Denny's because <laughs> I'm supposed to eat less. I don't feel like yeah, eating yeah. less. I feel like eating the same <laughs> thing I did when I was 20. You know, it's not working out. Anyway, uh, that's... You know, there's going to be a lot of sweaters sold in, in France. That's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Get into the sweater business. And Brian, from the Nebraska Examiner, and I know you have a subscription. Brian, do you? Do you? Do you have a subscription to that one? No, but I will. Next time I'm on the Press Reader app, I will look for the Nebraska Examiner. Okay. Well, shout out to the Nebraska Examiner staff. Um, a Southwest Iowa ethanol plant has been ordered to pay $10,000 fine for its repeated air emissions of excessive cancer-causing compounds in the last five years. Uh, you know, I, I live near a ref oil refinery, a heavy oil yep. upgrader refinery, and I complained about the smell, and I told you that there's an author and a team of journalists looking at that over four years. And, I'm, you know, they're, they're looking to go to ethanol and stuff like that and, and biofuel fuel for planes and stuff like that. They're trying to diversify. And there's even canola crushing plants going up around it. But this proves to me, and the reason why I mention it, is that even these plants can have horrible emissions, like formaldehyde. You know, yeah. this, this plant was spewing out formaldehyde and other byproducts of its fermentation process that are known to have adverse health risks like cancer. So actual harm to the environment and public health may have occurred, uh, says this uh, order from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and due to the amount of pollutants that were and are being emitted. So, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind when you think that, oh, good, your refinery is going bio. It, it can be bad for you as well if you live near one. Yeah, no, I've never been a fan of the biofuels. It's a stopgap that we probably don't need. Yeah. Okay, so uh, rumors are heating up about a possible Tesla factory here in Canada. So um, public companies have to disclose their lobbying efforts. So um, Electrek and others have reported on this. And uh, apparently Tesla is looking at Quebec and Ontario for some type of factory. I mean... Could be a car factory, could be a battery factory, could be both. Who knows? What's your bet? Could be even. Where's your bet growing right now? Uh, I'm thinking it will be a car factory, and I'm thinking oh. Quebec. Um, there is a long history of not only automobile production in Ontario and Quebec, but also mining a lot of the minerals. And of course, Tesla's trying to local source as many of the 
minerals and, and metals and stuff needed for electric cars, for the batteries. So yeah, best case scenario, a battery and car plant. Um, and I'm leaning towards Quebec, but that's really just a guess. I'm leaning towards not being a normal car plant, like not a XY3. Uh, not a full-blown thing. No, yeah. it could be batteries or it could be something weird like cyber trucks and semis. That's my guess. Yeah. Because uh, they, they both take up a lot of batteries. So maybe they'll just make yeah. the batteries for those two things. And uh, I don't know. I like they'll, they'll be able to transport them uh, to the East Coast because that's kind of a, you know, one of the challenges of the Texas plant is having to transport all that stuff to the other half of the country, yeah. the Eastern half. Yeah. And like I say, there's a huge history of doing this. Like all the major car brands have factories or have had factories in Ontario and Quebec and Canada. So clearly there's a decent reason to do it. I mean, if others have done it, then probably it'd be a work for Tesla as well. And on the Great Lakes, that's a port. That's access to a port. So if you wanted to ship to Europe, that's another option. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not just uh, the eastern part of North America. It's a shorter shipping route to to Europe, where a lot of yeah. these things are going to be bought over the next little while. So I was on, once again, I know I mentioned this a lot, but I was on the Chevy Bolt user group that is largely the United States. There's a post, there's so many people there compared to Canada that there's mm. a post every couple of minutes and it, it eats up my Facebook feed, but I always find it interesting, Brian. And there's a guy named Randy Moffat, which is interesting because I went to high school with a guy, with a person of that name. <laughs> and uh, the fear of change, this is something that he pointed out in a, uh, a Facebook post talking about all the hate that EV owners were getting. And so he came into this and he said, the fear of change uh, is has a word. It's called, oh God, metathesiophobia. Meta do you want to give good. that one a try? No. no. <laughs> Look, you do, <laughs> no, you, you do Finland pronunciations. Why can't you do this? Meta no, I, I think you did it slowly, but you did it about right. Okay. So it is the fear of change. And I hadn't heard of this one before. Have you heard of that one? I've heard of lots of phobias. No. So I'm not. This no. is basically what's going on in the world. If you were looking at yeah. Facebook hate and people uncomfortable with EVs. So why do they give a crap? I mean, yeah. you could say, well, they're forced to in 2035 or in California and other places. Mm -hmm. But that's not really a pressing issue right now. It's not here before us. Why do people hate on EVs so much? And it is a fear that people are going through a fear of change. And the fear of change is evolutionary in humans. Our internal predispositions teach us to resist change, mainly to always feel in control. So these people are feeling out of control. And these are the yeah. people who like to feel in control the most in our comfort zone. And the change is necessary, though. If you're not changing, you're not growing up, says Forbes magazine. Yeah, and of course, it isn't just a hatred of EVs. It's just a reaction to, um, you know, people are scared about getting off fossil fuels, which it seems like a weird thing to us because it's a whole new dawn of a fantastic new day. It's nothing but good news getting off fossil fuels. But yeah, people are just scared about change. And you see it a lot in Alberta, our neighboring oil province, where people are just absolutely dead set on sticking with that what they know, which is oil and gas. And here's a clip from YouTube. We are all afraid of the uncertainty that comes with change. We would rather things be not so great than go through the risk and process of change. So this specific phobia can reduce one's will to live. So this is pretty extreme. Wow. The phobes who have this often feel like they have no control over their lives owing to constant changes. She, he tends to live in the past and may also be depressed. So there you go. Uh, their phobia makes them unwilling to move. So um, Randy says on this Facebook post, I became interested in computers in the early 1970s and learned to program. So that's very early. Like, you know, very yeah. few people were doing it the, the back then. I was always on the cutting edge of technology. The amount of hate was palatable with people accusing me of being a Satanist. Randy's from the States where there's lots of, you know, Baptists and, and religion and stuff. <laughs> uh, people said they would never own one. This is a computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we are going through this again, he says. However, now the government is, in, is issuing mandates for this transition to EVs, making the fear even worse. When I got my first EV almost nine years ago, I had neighbors calling me crazy. My next door neighbor 
said he would never own one. Last weekend, he told me he just ordered his third. So be patient, <laughs> be non-confrontational, just set a quiet example, and someday, just like computers, they will figure it out. And I thought that was a great post I wanted to share with our listeners. No, this happens all the time. Like I follow photography and cameras and stuff, and there's a move now from optical viewfinders to electronic viewfinders and cameras. And it's progressed enough that, that people have accepted it. But, you know, two or three years ago, you had people just hatred for electronic viewfinders on cameras. Like people just hated the idea of it. And one by one, they're all moving to it. You know, it was just, it happened too quickly for them to comprehend. Um, I don't know. I, as soon as I found out about it, I thought it was fantastic and I couldn't wait to switch. So yeah, it's, this is definitely a, a, a mindset, conservatives versus progressives. I had one on a point and shoot camera, oh, 15, long time ago, a lot of years ago yeah. in, in the digital camera age. Uh, didn't yeah. care for it. Of course. They were crappy. They were cra then, you couldn't yeah. focus. You couldn't do anything. They're, uh, yeah. I'm sure they're getting a lot better and I've not actually used one myself. No, it, it was very clear to me early on it was the way of the future. But, um, yeah, people just take much, much longer, generally speaking, to catch on. All right, let's dip into the mailbag. And coming up with the show is the lightning round, where we skip through the rest of the weekend's week's headlines very quickly. Uh, the user feedback this week comes from Doug in Colorado, who wrote about our May 2nd show. Doug? You're behind. You've got a lot of catching up to do. You know, take some time <laughs> off work if you have to. Listen, listen, binge, listen our show. So he says to us, thank you for highlighting the problem of light trespass from harsh glaring LED streetlight fixtures. And he says an excellent resource is the International Dark Sky Association. They have everything people need to know about light pollution, including model lighting ordinance. And also thanks for coming to the UPS, a replacement gasoline mail delivery van contract debacle, hoping Canada learns from the United States. The U.S. is making, uh, you know, big mistakes and I hopefully pushes Canada to do much better. Yeah, so I vaguely remember talking about <laughs> LED lighting back in May. That was a long time ago. Um, LED lighting, I think what we said at the time, it's a fantastic opportunity to upgrade things and make it better and reduce light pollution. But you know, since LED lights are still kind of new technology, a lot of the designs aren't great. Cities don't quite know how to implement them yet. And yeah, a lot of the times they're just too harsh. But yeah, my pet peeve is the brightness. And, you know, we have the ability now to put them on timers and control the brightness. So, you know, street lights could come on at full power kind of in the dusk times. And then, you know, you could eventually back those off at three in the morning, just turn all the street lights down. And if you've ever been out in the middle of the night, you don't need a whole lot of light to see once your, your eyes are adjusted. You know, I'm surrounded by a ridiculous amount of light pollution. I'm thankful that they changed the street lights in our um, neighborhood here to LED that have a slight warmth to them. And they're, they're less bright than the previous, I would say, overall. They, they disperse them better and they, they even yeah. that out. And that's fine. Uh, however, my neighbor across the street, across the boulevard, has a he's, he's you know he's the person with the police stickers all over his house. He's scared of getting, you know, yeah. killed, <laughs> and he's mm -hmm. got this bright white LEDs just glaring on his property like a landing strip for an airport. <laughs> and then across the pipeline field, which is I don't know fifty meters across, fifty yards across, there's another guy who has a giant white light in his backyard, and it shines and. I can yeah. see the gophers, you know, and anything going around in the night. And uh, then there's a school there as well, which is uh, further away from me. But th yeah. they have this anti uh, never to well um, lighting to keep people from, you know, doing things there because people do do things Loitering. there. <laughs> yeah. But it's blindedly bright and it's, it shines in my drapes and it's you know, a long ways away. And it's just it's light pollution. And all these lights that I speak of are not on the spectrum of warmth. So they, they're they yeah. the bluer side and they bounce. And those are the, yeah. the wavelengths that bounce up into the sky the most. And I think I talked about this on the show, but I've got a street light just right outside of my house. And a couple of years ago, the bulb went out and it was the greatest because I, I didn't, I don't want that giant street lamp shining in my windows at night. It was so great. I was very disappointed when they fixed it. You should have uh, rented a bucket truck and went up there and put some tape over it, you know, just, uh, <laughs> just to lessen it. Uh, or put in a low wattage bulb. And also yesterday I was coming home from Home Depot 
and I saw two uh, pickup or two um, trucks with uh, Amazon delivery vehicles on them. Like there was four Amazon delivery prime trucks, the kinds that mm. look like the EVs that they're coming out in the States. Oh. So of course I went and checked them out and saw the giant tailpipes on them and was very disappointed. Uh, but they look, there's a Ford Transit um, vans converted and, yeah. you know, they should look, they should be EVs and they're not. We don't have those around here. We have a third party delivery service, don't we, in Regina? No, it, and it's, uh, yeah, no, it hasn't been great for electric sort of transit vans around here. Yeah, but there was one place, remember, last week we talked about a place in Saskatoon that got one for delivering in a bakery, and it's just... And they're saving money it's, hand over... It's free. It's the, they said it's paying for the payments. The same money they save on gas is paying for the payments for the new vehicle. So how great is that? And of course, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so, you know, right now, get out your pen, get out your typewriter, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Write us with an angry letter. Tell us when we're wrong. Tell us when you agree or disagree with us. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok. At Clean Energy Pod is our handle. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for all kinds of things going on. We've got two YouTube channels. I dare you to find the second one that has the audio-only podcast. Probably can't do it. Leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash show. You know, it's been ages since anybody left us a voicemail at, at SpeakPipe, so be fantastic if somebody did that. Yes, we'll mention your name and your birthday. So mention your birthday, we'll mention your birthday. <laughs> Here we go, Brian. It's the Clean Energy Show lightning round where we breeze through the headlines and end the show on a fast pace. End-of-life batteries from electric vehicles are not likely to be the primary source of recyclable material until the mid-2030s, according to Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Yeah, I think we talked about that last week or the week before, that uh, it's going to be a very slow ramp-up because electric vehicle batteries are just lasting way longer than people thought. Uh, our friend Donald Trump has gone on a nonsensical rant about electric cars the other day at a rally. He says we need to get rid of them. The story was on electric. And uh, we have a clip, but I'm not going to play the man, okay? I said to myself, yeah, how, how can we cover this and not hear his stupid freaking voice? You already said his name, which gives me... Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Creeps, but, I like how Stephen um, Colbert does it. They have Twitter yeah, people uh, come up with nicknames, which always make me laugh. names for him every... <laughs> But this is very, very similar to the British PM, what the rant about solar panels. Yeah. This is kind of the same thing. This is trying to make it into a culture war type of issue. Well, speaking of Britain, uh, I had a computer read his text in a posh British accent. So here it is. Fantastic. A friend of mine wanted to do something for the environment. He went out and bought an electric car. And he made a certain trip, I won't say from where, Kentucky. And he is a good person. He wants to do what's well. And now he <laughs> understands, hey, not so good. He bought an electric car and he made the trip often from Kentucky to Washington, and he made it. He would drive down, put the car away and drive back. He was getting like 38 miles per gallon. It took me more time to charge in the damn car than I could spend in a drive-in. It took me two and a half times. My name is Donald J. Trump and I'm an idiot. A complete and total <laughs> idiot. Please enjoy listening to the Clean Energy Show. Hopefully Brian <laughs> isn't drunk this week. <laughs> Okay. Well, that was a bit added on at the end there, but you get the idea. It made no sense at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and we all know uh, electric cars work great for road trips. They do. And, you know, the author of that electric piece, uh, Fred Lambert, pointed out that he went from New Orleans up to Quebec. Didn't have to stop for more than 30 minutes. And, I mean, he had to dine anyway. He had to eat something and go to the bathroom and stretch his leg. Yeah. It wasn't an inconvenience at all for him and his Tesla. Yeah, with the caveat that the Tesla charging network is definitely the best and the third-party chargers maybe not as good and you might still have some issues there. Have you heard of Boston Consulting Group before? Often it no. is quoted in the news on different things. It is a major consulting group. So four years, this is four years of Boston Consulting Group's U.S. electric vehicle sales forecasts. This is something that Wall Street relies on, consulting groups like this. And this is an evolution of... Um, how their forecasts have changed. We talked about this type of thing on the show that people are always revising their forecasts and we could have yeah. told them differently, you know, oh, yeah, on these absolutely. years. So in 2018, 
They said 21% of sales of, will be EVs in 2030. This is the United States. Yep. Two years later, they said, oops, 26. Year after yep. that, 42. <laughs> That's a big jump. And then this year, they're now saying 53%, which is a lot more common. And even that is like, you know, we doubt that. We think it's going to be more than yeah. that, that is, things are going to Th tip. This is an S-curve adoption, and we're at the steep part of the S-curve. This is going to go up way faster than people think. Just think back to, you know, when smartphones were first introduced, and everyone's like, hmm, that's kind of a weird thing. And then you blink, and a couple of years later, everybody had a smartphone, and that's how fast it goes. You're looking at the chart now on our script. Look how, where it levels off. It levels off uh, between 55 and 75%. Yeah, they're still kind of doing it wrong. That's They're still underestimating. S-curves of adoption don't level off until around 90%, like color TVs, cell phones, stuff like yeah, that, Yeah, when the last 10% is the hard to get. So don't see it. Yeah, and I will say, like, manufacturing cars, electric cars, is a lot more difficult probably than manufacturing something like a smartphone. So it maybe won't go as quickly as the smartphone, but it is going to go fast. Uh, from Carbon Tracker, just over 3,000 solar installations are being carried out every week in Britain. And that is up from 1,000 a week just two years ago. So it's tripled the home. That's a lot. The home uh, solar installations have tripled in two years. So, oh. 3,000 in a week. That's crazy. It's time for a CS Fast Fact. <laughs> Hawaii produces more renewable energy than all of Canada. Were you sitting down for that? Wow. What's that? Were you sitting down for that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, your posture is excellent about, this week, by the way. Uh, I'm happy to it, see your I back is had better. To, yeah, I haven't had to change position. But yeah, we reported a couple of weeks ago they got their last shipment of coal for their last coal-fired electricity plant. And that plant did close down uh, just the other day. So that's great. So yeah, the regulatory consequences are clear. If utilities fail to meet the renewable targets, they're forced to pay penalties, which must be covered by company... Um, shareholders and rather than the taxpayers. And that's the way it should be. That should be the lesson for everybody. The shareholders should have to cover it, not the rate payers. Electric school yep. buses in Massachusetts provided energy back to the grid for more than eight hours this summer. 80 hours. 80. That is a lot of hours uh, of emergency heat wave protection from buses that weren't doing anything because they're electric. They were sitting around all summer and this is a great, you know, Use case in the United States where they have less severe winters, but summer heat waves need that grid backup. And those electric buses, which are just starting to trickle in, really, for schools, are there and useful. So that's awesome. Fantastic. 10 of 13 flagship CCS, that is carbon capture and sequestration, Ryan Sequest, uh, projects failed to deliver, according to IEEFA analysis. Uh, and that's 50%. Uh, of goals haven't even been reached. And that's what our Boundary Dam, they mentioned the Boundary Dam, the first thing they mentioned, right here in Saskatchewan. Yep. No. Yeah, we had one of the first carbon capture on a coal plant, and they have captured some carbon, but nowhere near what they thought they were. From Mars Technica, e-bike battery fires are pushing New York City towards a ban in public housing. That is, public housing is banning e-bikes. This is quite disturbing. 26 battery-based fires in public housing since 2021. That is a lot. I mean, laptops can do that, too. Uh, E-bike battery is made up of dozens of individual AA-sized batteries, um, 18,000 of I them. I think they mean the 18650 cells. Wired like together and managed by a battery cells. management system. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, pardon me. The 18650 cells, there are dozens of them are wired together, dozens of those cells, uh, in a battery management system. Yeah, and my we're talking last week doesn't we have told a, a that you have to unplug. You can't just so keep charging. So maybe that's the in, reason. But, uh, yeah, I can see where this could turn out to be a huge problem. <laughs> and by the way, uh, my partner shops at Shoppers Drug Mart, Weird. and they had an e-bike in there for two hundred and fifty dollars for the weekend. Yeah. But it yeah. was just this tiny little thing that didn't have pedals. It just had spikes to put your feet on. It's a battery fire and waiting to happen. Yeah, it, I looked it up. Yeah. It's it's it, for two fifty was good. I mean, I would buy it for my kid maybe if I had a younger kid to to whiz around. But I don't think it's that practical. 
Um, but the price really got me, and it went back up to three fifty or something afterwards, or four hundred. In other places, it's six, eight hundred dollars. So um, yeah. Anyway, that's interesting. Like you know, sometimes those things are mismanaged. The charging is mismanaged. They're faulty. They're damaged. They're waterlogged. But a five-year-old was killed in a fire, and it's very tragic. And uh, just be careful if you have an e-bike battery. Don't yeah. you know? Read the manual and be aware that you're not supposed to leave it. You, in many cases, you're not supposed to leave them charging indefinitely. Um, but in, they're not inherently dangerous either. So just but anything that is a battery that charges. I mean, my charge and yeah. lead acid battery in my house for my um, my uh, RV. So you got to be careful. Uh, Washington Post amid a bonanza of measures passed to cut the state's carbon emissions in California as fast as possible, the legislature in California approved a thousand dollar refundable tax credit to poor Califor Californians who don't own vehicles. So it's paying people not to own vehicles. If you are poor-ish, <laughs> I might even qualify, it will head to the desk of uh, Newsom soon, and he's going to sign it. He's expected to sign it. The bill offers the tax credit to single filers earning up to $40,000 and joint filers up to $60,000 uh, who live without personal cars. And you can get it whether you make yeah, that a great. lot of tax money or not. You know, and you can just get that $1,000 regardless. And maybe that's something we'll start to see uh, other places. I've heard the concept before, but this is the first time I've seen it, uh, you know, getting passed. Oh, another CES fast fact from Nat Bullard from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. 100, there are 148,026 convenience stores in the United States. Okay, 148,000. 116,000 of those sell motor fuel. 80% of U.S. motor fuel sales are, believe it or not, at convenience stores. And 60.4% of convenience stores yeah. are single store operators. What he's saying is, look out, change is coming. And Brian, that is our time for this week. It's been fun as always. Glad you're feeling better. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Remember, contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com and all the rest of the places. And if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe so you get our podcast every week. And we'll see you next time.